Shamai and uh, welcome to BTC IoT. Today we've got a bit of a treat. Um, we've started building a hardware wallet using the SB32 and a little e-paper screen. The idea being that it will educate people on how hardware wallets work and then also has some unique functionality which, we, which, which we're going to be discussing. Um, so I thought it made sense to get uh, Stepan on who's actually the guy who built the um, the Bitcoin Arduino library, which we're using, um, and also the guy who wrote most of the code in um, in San Francisco when we met and we started dorking out over hardware wallets. Um, uh, so he's, it's an absolute pleasure to have him on. Stepan uh, works for with Crypto Advance, um, and he, he's, he's a researcher in hardware um, and hardware wallets, um, and he's also develops a lot of free and open source stuff as well, which is part of his crypto. Him and Crypto Advance kind of intermingled. Is he, Stepan is is Crypto Advance. Um, so yeah, so that he generates a lot of a lot of really good uh, research and a lot of really good materials for people to use. Um, so uh, hello, Stepan. Hey, hey. Yeah, thanks I for having me here. <laughs> no, thanks, thanks for coming on. We've been trying to do this for for a few days, um, but uh, no, it's great. It's great to, to finally get you on. So a quick background, Stepan, just on people for people um, uh, who, who who don't know who you are and and, and on your on your background because you didn't um, come. You you you. So you stopped, you didn't start in Bitcoin, you started... Uh, or, or yeah, so I'm not a real developer. Yeah, so I'm... <laughs> uh, I used to be a quantum physicist for uh, more than a decade. And uh, there, normally, you just have to build stuff that doesn't exist. So I was uh, building different electronic projects uh, for our research web uh, for uh, all that time uh, and uh, yeah last year i switched uh, from quantum physics to bitcoin uh, and uh, actually like two years ago or maybe even more uh, when i uh, well i actually started making my own hobby project a hardware wallet for myself because yeah, i just wanted something uh, different from what is available on the market because i'm paranoid and i don't trust people mm, yeah so this is how uh, this uh, arduino library appeared at first so it was my uh, kind of uh, effort to learn how bitcoin works and uh, to implement everything by myself so uh, then uh, i switched to the trezor crypto library to uh, do all the underlying cryptography uh, and Currently, I'm working on uh, switching to SecP to 56K1. It is the library that is used in Bitcoin Core. Uh, so, like uh, user reference uh, implementation, I'd say. Uh, so, even though I uh, joined Crypto Advance uh, and doing like a real hardware wallet now, uh, I still think that uh, all this. Uh, makers, tinkers, and uh, these efforts are very important. So we need more different hardware. I mean, absolutely. Like, so just this little project alone, I've learned so much about how Bitcoin works and how signatures work, how you know how you, how, how you have signature derivation and how you have a, a master public key, a master private key, and how they generate um, uh, other signatures and, 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 and the different BIPs and how the different BIPs work. Um, so uh, Core doesn't use, so the, the hardware wallet we've made so far it uses uh, bit 39 to use a random number to generate a, a mnemonic uh, phrase, which then generates a seed, which you can then pass over to like bit 84, which um, can derive addresses from the public master key and the, the private master key. Mm -hmm. So Core doesn't use that. Uh, so Core uh, uses uh, these uh, HD keys, so the master and private keys, but they don't use mnemonics uh, because so the BIP39 uh, only defines how we convert from words from this phrase uh, to the actual master private key and master public key. Uh, well, yeah, to the seed and uh, that stuff. So uh, this step is not implemented in Bitcoin Core because uh, well, BIP39 uh, has some unsolved issues. Uh, it uses a fixed dictionary. So currently all the wallets support only English uh, dictionary. And uh, it is a little bit problematic because everyone has to use the same dictionary all the time. Yeah, so there are different actually alternatives to uh, BIP39. One is uh, what Electrum uses. Electrum uses their own uh, mnemonic format. Uh, and instead of the, uh, well, they use a different uh, type of the checksum. And in Electrum, uh, you can have uh, any word list you want. So there you don't, uh, 
have to limit yourself to English uh, 2048 words. You can use whatever you want. And uh, back in the days, I even wrote a simple generator of uh, for mnemonic phrases with emojis instead of words. So it is uh, not very useful, but uh, just as an proof of concept. Uh, another thing that I don't like about BIP39 uh, is uh, that uh, the checksum of this uh, mnemonic phrase. So basically, you have this 24 words, and the last word contains a checksum, just to make sure that you didn't enter the wrong words, uh, or you at least can uh, detect that. Uh, so it is generated using uh, hash functions. So you just take all the previous entropy and uh, hash it. Uh, and this means that you can't really generate it being offline without any digital devices. So like, I can pick randomly 24 words by throwing dice, let's say, or by printing them, shuffling them, and picking them. Uh, but then I will not get a um, completely correct mnemonic. I need to fix the last word. And if I want to do this, I need some kind of device that can calculate the hash. Uh, and so to, humans, run the, to run the check to run the checksum at the end. Yeah, yeah, to get the from the correct checksum at the end. And humans are extremely good at calcul uh, bad at calculating hashes. Uh, so uh, yeah, you need some kind of uh, microcontroller or a computer, and so basically to enter your seat to this device to get the correct checksum. So I would prefer something uh, maybe like XOR or a SUM or something else, something that humans actually can do. Uh, for this checksum. Uh, but, well, yeah, so these are a few problems that I don't really uh, like. Uh, yeah, in I the mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it, th that I, but then I noticed when we actually, when actually building the hardware wallet and then trying to get it to um, uh, be compatible or trying to um, generate, I don't know, what the same, using the same public key, then generate watch only wallets on, on something like Electrum. And then you end up with like compatibility issues, not using this bit, not using that bit. And having worked with Lightning, like mostly Lightning stuff in the past, where um, uh, a lot of things are kind of compatible and you don't really have those those kind of issues. And it was like, it, it was, I, I found it really like frustrating and confusing. And um, uh, and I can, it's a very, I suppose it is, it's, it's probably important that there's such strong opinions when it comes to different ways of generating randomness. Um, and generating your, your keys, uh, but it's, it's it's quite frustrating to work with, isn't it? Like on a on a hardware, and you kind of feel the pain of the people who actually have these who have to develop and build these hardware wallets. Um, um, yeah, but uh, at the moment, BIP39 is uh, the standard that is used by most uh, software wallets and hardware wallets. So yeah, Bitcoin Core doesn't implement that. But also, I don't think that uh, people should use Bitcoin Core to store uh, private keys. I would, yeah. uh, I, I kind of uh, think of Bitcoin Core as a demon that watches the blockchain and maybe monitors your transactions, your addresses, uh, but doesn't contain the private keys. So for private keys, we have hard wallets or maybe air get machines or something so yeah i mean i think i think hard for most people hardware wallets are, are the best answer aren't they um uh, for for storing that for storing their private keys um but um yeah so so uh obviously thanks so much for helping um uh, make make the, the project a reality i'm so glad you're working on it as well like uh, uh and it was a real serendipitous moment when i was sat with you and i was like oh yeah you know it'd be great if you could make a hardware wallet with a with an ASP32 and you're like, you can, and I wrote the library. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was the yeah, and the ne next day we actually had it already, or the day after that, yeah. Oh, it was incredible, it was incredible. I kept saying bye-bye to you in the night, and then the next morning you'd be like, yep, stayed up till three, built it. <laughs> um, uh, so I thought it probably made sense if we, if we uh, showed people the library, um, and then uh, I was gonna try and get up on the computer. I'll put a link in the description of the video so people can have a look through. I can uh, add a few uh, things about the library, like uh, to comment it a bit. Uh, so as it was my hobby project for quite a while, and uh, now I uh, continue working on that, but I never really had time to properly document it uh, and, uh, yeah, also, I was learning while, while writing this. Uh, this means that it is not production ready, right? So to, give you, to give you credit, though, like, you know, when you work with Arduino, some of the libraries which you install, I mean, your library is very well documented compared to a lot of libraries. I know it's probably not <laughs> to your standard, but for 
the, the, a lot of the Arduino hobbyist uh, maker community it's it's pretty well documented. So, yeah, so I, I I really want to add more examples and to write a proper documentation like how to use all this stuff and maybe some basic explanation of uh, this master private uh, public keys and all these beeps and stuff. Uh, so uh, if people want to kind of help with that, I will be very happy because uh, well. Yeah, uh, I can also help uh, answering the questions over Telegram. So whoever wants to use this library, I will be very glad to see these people and uh, help them to build stuff. So, you okay. know, I'm very enthusiastic about that. Uh, but also, uh, I think that at some point uh, I will slightly change the API and also I'm uh, working on this uh, underlying cryptographic implementations like switching from uh, Trezor to uh, Bitcoin Core. Um, crypto libraries uh, and maybe uh, also i really hope that we will make a micro python binding so you will be able not only to use it with arduino but also with circuit python micro python um yeah rust on the roadmap but uh, not very soon uh, in principle if something doesn't work write me or uh, make an, e an issue but yeah so library there and uh, it works in most yeah. of the cases <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so it's specifically built for developing hardware wallets, isn't this library? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, because I was uh, writing it exactly for yeah. that reason. Yeah. But it, it can also do other things. So if you want to, uh, well, I also have some parts for Lightning, but they're not there yet. Uh, yeah. Well, at the moment, probably the normal use case is some kind of hardware wallet. So mostly the stuff for uh, signing and key derivation is uh, useful there. I mean, it's cool for open, leaving it open as well for future developments, because I mean, the, there is a lack of Bitcoin compatible libraries for, for Arduino. Um, and uh, I think just getting Ard the, the maker Arduino microcontroller community is absolutely ginormous and there's some real talent in there. So getting them to, to get involved building some of this stuff um, and then just Bitcoiners as well. And one of the great things about um, microcontrollers is there's a range of modules you can attach to the microcontroller and there's some functionality which probably no one's ever thought of. And then you, you plug a module in and then you use a module in a certain way, like, like, like you did with the e-paper. Um, uh, even though it's like a $15 whatever uh, uh, hardware wallet, you've got that functionality being able to power off the 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 wallet and you still have that nice new uh, address that bitcoin address which you can take around and you can use for people to send you bitcoin um so there's actually a unique selling point there's there's some functionality which no hardware wallet has on the planet which is um just from a, you know a few days yeah, also if you want uh, some kind of uh, custom scripts like for example to uh, have a time lock contract uh, in all your bitcoin so like uh, you will be able to spend your bitcoins only after a certain date uh, then you can't use it with existing hardware wallets but with this thing uh, you actually can uh, right. or do coin join and uh, or whatever else yeah maybe we should cover like some of the because there are some actual like pos positive i mean obviously education is the, the main positive aspect of building uh, your own hardware wallet on something like an esp32 but there's there's, there's well probably it's probably a good idea just to cover some of the, the, the positive positive aspects of it and then some of the ne negative you know aspects of, of building your own hardware wallet um so what what other kind of positive aspects do you think there are to to this kind of implementation of a hardware wallet building your own on them something like mm -hmm. a, a well you know an only sp32 uh so first of all uh having a homemade hardware wallet means uh and yeah using it by itself i i probably would not recommend using just this uh, 15 bucks esp32 hardware wallet i would recommend using it in combination with other hardware wallets so let's say you have uh, your trezor cold card you use them in the multi-signature setup and then you add this uh, esp32 hardware wallet as a third signer uh, and in this case, even if uh, Trezor and uh, code card are uh, broken uh, because there is a known vulnerability or uh, because uh, they were replaced during the supply channel attack, uh, you still have your own small device that is a custom implementation with custom logic that you wrote that uses a, uh, off the shelf components that are not Bitcoin specific. So you just bought them uh, from China or your local electronic store or your local Arduino store. Some of the cities have them. Uh, 
uh, and um, yeah, you just uh, use it as a completely different. So it provides a completely different security model. So completely different from normal hardware wallets. And I think this is very valuable. Uh, the bad thing is that you can screw up and then you can lock up your funds. So you need to be careful and you need to check everything. Uh, and have, and have a backup, I suppose, as well, something you can, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in principle, uh, you have a backup, right? Uh, so only if the uh, receiving address is somehow wrong. Uh, but this is normally generated by the uh, Bitcoin core. So uh, still, I think that there are ways to lock up your funds, but uh, I just don't know how exactly, because for me, uh, oh, you would still, I, you mean, so you'd still be able to recover your funds as a whole, um, but you wouldn't be able to co-sign. Um, so that, that recovery is obviously safe as you usually make your backup, your Bitcoin backup, but then you're mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to co-sign for transactions that, that, that part yeah so to, maybe to you back. yeah if you fail with the signing if something is wrong with your code then maybe you will need to have another hardware wallet that is a normal one to re recover from your mnemonic phrase and then use that for co-signing but uh, i mean that yeah it is for testing but i think that as soon as it works it will continue working. So you just test on the test net and then you switch to the main net if you want. Um, yeah, cool. and also another nice thing about this, uh, this device is you can add uh, really weird uh, security measures. For example, uh, you can notify yourself when your hardware wallet is moved. So it can wake up on the accelerometer and then send you a telegram message that, OK, uh, someone moved me. Uh, so you know that it, maybe you are under evil maid attack when someone is trying to replace something or, uh, yeah, so crazy functionality. Uh, but yeah, also security of normal hardware wallets is normally better than this do-it-yourself things because they put a lot of work on this uh, secure boots uh, things and uh, also proper memory uh, protect using the memory protection units and uh, using maybe secure elements, some of them and so on. So uh, probably if the attacker gets your device, they can extract the, uh, the seed from there. But uh, as it is a custom implementation, it may be a little bit harder or at least different from the normal case. If you could just mention quickly, I know you do a whole range of tools. If you just mention quickly, like the concept of having multiple um, processors on a hardware wallet and like the benefit of something like that, and then how that relates to generating uh, private keys or, or you know, using something like Schnorr to generate private keys. Uh, well, so uh, also the uh, you get better security when you uh, use different, uh, let's say, security models because in the multi signature setup, the uh, the security only adds up. So if you, let's say, have uh, different microcontrollers from different manufacturers, for example, the secure element from Infineon that is super secure, but it is closed source, uh, so you don't really know what is there and if there are government backdoors, but uh, it has a tremendous uh, hardware security then uh, you add on top of that risk 5 microcontroller that has problems with hardware security but it is completely open source open core uh, so you know what exactly is running there but uh, yeah other problems uh, and then you add uh, stm microcontroller let's say ARM microcontroller that is the most uh, popular one so uh, even if there is an attack uh, it will be uh, known pretty quickly and fixed pretty quickly. Uh, so, and then uh, your overall security is better than each of them because uh, for the attacker to hack your hardware wallet, he needs to hack all three of these microcontrollers to get all three of the keys. So, because you use a single key on every microcontrol. Mm, yeah, and uh, it becomes extremely easy to use with Schnorr signatures because there everything looks like a single key at the end. So you don't even notice uh, this additional security, but it uh, mm, appears there under the hood. Um, that's the idea, and uh, that's why i really uh, looking forward to get uh, to see Schnorr on Bitcoin blockchain. That would be awesome. So just to clarify, I mean, this, this, that, that approach to a hard world doesn't actually currently exist, but um, once, once we get Shinor on Bitcoin, then those sorts of things will become possible. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. And is that something which um, uh, you guys are thinking of, of, of or because obviously with Crypto Advance, you, um, I mean, 
are you going to develop a hardware wallet like um yeah yeah research. so uh we also we are developing the mm, let's say uh, developer board developer toolbox and also uh the um, hardware wallet for like normal people uh, and uh, there we will have uh, three different microcontrollers and as soon as Schnorr there we uh, are planning to use all three of them for this increased security uh, like for right. normally CDSA it will not work so we will probably still keep keys uh, for the normal um transactions uh in uh, the secure element but if you want to uh use schnorr only then you can get this extra stuff yeah. i like the way you said uh, a hardware wallet for normal people so there'll be kind of a, a really um accessible ui uh, experience on that uh, yeah yeah so uh it will have a um, kind of phone type form factor, uh, but still the microcontrollers inside, the secure element and uh, no uh, operation system, only like uh, the security uh, focused stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, also a, an option to use it in a completely air get uh, mode, uh, such that uh, you transfer the data back and forth with QR codes, because well, we have a pretty far screen and we also have a camera to scan QR codes. Um, yeah, but uh, it will be uh, probably mid of next year so it's not very soon no, uh, no, no. Board I, I, will be I think it's uh, good. Soon. I think your approach is absolutely perfect like all this all this um, research and development stuff um, and I think so many people just try and rush a product to market and then they just copy their competitors and they don't actually bring anything new to market whereas you guys sound like you're really bringing something new and something useful to, to, to the market which is which is absolutely brilliant um, uh, right so we've covered crypto advance we've covered the the library some of the functionality of the library. Oh yeah, this is what I want to ask you about. So you said about air gapping your hardware wallet. So you can take an unsigned transaction. So I'm gonna ask some stupid questions now, okay? Because mm -hmm. this is very much, um, um, I'll advise people when we go on to the full hardware wallet tutorial that, that you know they, they go back and they watch the tutorials and they also watch this interview because we're gonna cover some sort of simple concepts or simple mm -hmm. concepts, I don't know. Um, uh, but um, so I, I take a, an unsigned transaction off the computer and then I, I put it on an SD card and I stick it in the thing. Right, this is for uh, the air gap thing, isn't it? I stick it in the hardware wallet and then I get it to sign the transaction and then I take that and I stick it back in the computer and then it's a signed transaction using my private keys. How does that work? <laughs> what does what does it look like as well? What does it, what does the script look like? Like so what does the actual unsigned trans because this is all stuff which happens under the hood. I never see, you know, I, it's my Trezor takes care of it, whatever. Mm -hmm. So how does all that stuff actually happen? Like what, what, what's going on there? Okay, so uh, on the computer, you have your uh, watch-only wallet that doesn't have any private keys. Uh, it has your uh, public keys though. So it knows what addresses to watch and it knows the uh, your UTXO set. So like your unspent transactions that it can use to send money. So there you prepare an unsigned transaction uh, where you basically say that, okay, I will use this UTXO that I saw. Uh, I want to have these outputs. And here is the additional metadata that will help my hardware wallet to derive the corresponding private keys and to actually sign the transaction. So basically you bunch all the, you put all the stuff together, the transaction itself that doesn't contain any signatures. And also this metadata that uh, helps uh, the hardware wallet to uh, sign, to verify, and to display information to the user. So then uh, you uh, put it in the either PSBT standard uh, or any other uh, type of uh, transaction that your hardware wallet will understand, and you send it to the hardware, uh, move it to the hardware wallet. Hardware wallet then. Well, so kind of. So that's so that's so that standard is like what hashing it to make it into less. Uh, so it's basically how exactly to encode all this metadata and the raw transactions such that uh, the signer that doesn't have uh, internet access uh, should be able to understand and sign it. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a partially signed Bitcoin transaction format. This is the standard that uh, is recommended to use now. Uh, and then uh, your hardware wallet can read all this stuff. Uh, then uh, using this meta information, uh, it knows first how to sign this transaction and second, more important, it can also tell you what of the out, which of the output is your 
average output and what is the amount that you are actually sending, what are the fees and all other stuff. Uh, so, um, and this is what you actually need to verify, right? So then you verify that yes, uh, exactly i need to, uh, i want to send this amount to this address and uh, all the change should go back to me so you confirm you sign and then the hardware wallet just knows how to uh, hash all this transaction into the mm, number that it signs uh, then uh, either it uh, puts the signatures directly into the place where they should be uh, or it just adds it to this metadata for your watch on the wallet to actually combine the transaction uh, to the overall uh, to the final thing um, yeah and then you just move these signatures uh, back to the computer and broadcast Fantastic. There we are. I did. I, I. I wasn't. I was just fuzzy. I just wasn't sure. And I thought it'd be a nice way to kind of um, introduce the, the the next video when we start start doing some of that stuff. Um, as I said before, like being able to add additional modules to things like ESP thirty twos is really useful. So there are some ESP thirty twos with SD SD card slots. You know, mm -hmm. um, so you could potentially have like an air cap device. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, in principle, yes. Uh, if you don't use Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and if, for example, you cover the whole device uh, in the well with the metallic shooting, like a Faraday cage, like a you know, Faraday cage. That sounds like a cool project. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So you just take a copper, uh, you know, the uh, copper tape and just uh, wind it around your uh, ESP32, and then you're done. Wow. Uh, I don't think that it is very hard. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I'm sure it has still got that functionality. I mean, we can turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. And um, uh, I'm amazed because I went to the bid devs uh, meet up a couple of days ago, and they were, they were talking about hardware. And they're talking about one in particular, which one of its selling points was that the chip didn't have like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, or you know, it was, it was. And then it actually worked out that when they did the security, whoever did the security audit, and managed to hack the thing that had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. In. I can't remember uh, the name. It was Elipal. Elipal. That was yeah. it. I know. Uh, Later group, uh, later dungeon guys. Yeah, oh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize it was by those guys. Um, and then I, I, and then I was like, I mean, from my limited experience, you know, cruising AliExpress, there's plenty of chips out there which which don't have Wi-Fi, which don't have Bluetooth, which you could use, you know. So um, uh, it seemed funny to me that they like picked such a such a goofy controller for their hardware wallet. Uh, well, they actually didn't use just a controller; they used an Android phone. So they just took an Android uh, standard uh, chip that is used for Android phones that usually has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and just disabled it. Yeah, so it's kind of it was an air gapped uh, uh, phone, Chinese phone. But they thought that it might not be might, might not be an issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah frankly speaking, uh, the security is basically the same as uh, if I would take my old phone. Uh, Put it into the airplane mode and install Electron Wallet there. It will be the same. Uh, which is actually quite good for some people, might be quite a good solution. Yeah, I, I used to use it uh, back in the days and it worked perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah the, I mean, so this is another thing which is worth bearing in mind as well is that security is kind of a spectrum. And then you have, you know, completely insecure you know, Bitcoin stored on your buggy computer or your, your phone, which has got loads of stupid like games installed on it or whatever. And then you, uh, then you have your, you know, your, your, cold wallet, paper wallet, which you generated on some uh, offline device or I don't know how you would do that. And then you've got your, your hardware wallets and then um, uh, and then you've got your secure phone, your secure desktop. And like the, the solution, which, which, you know, as well as being educational, uh, does fit between like it is, it is more secure to store your Bitcoin. Once you, you know, develop like a decent wallet, it would be more secure to store your Bitcoin on um, your private keys on a, an ESP32 than on um, than your, your laptop or a phone, for example, and would you say generally would it be more secure? Um, it depends. It uh, depends I, on your security model on the actual laptop. Yeah, so I would say that a AirGap phone is a pretty good option because uh, well, it has some built-in security because you need to either use your fingerprint, that is a probably a bad idea, but at least the pin code to uh, unlock the device. Um, and if it is in the air gap mode, then it's probably fine. Uh, the only problem is that uh, these Bluetooth and Wi-Fi chips are never completely off, so they still kind of work. So uh, for do-it-yourself things, uh, there is also a way to make it like secure, so with secure boot and uh, everything, and this is also what we want to do, such that people can actually build a 
nice uh, secure hardware wallets themselves but at the moment if you just try to do it naively like using arduino id and nothing else then it is not very secure because the firmware can be loaded from the chip back to the computer just easily it's still read and write access so you actually need to uh, put the security bits uh, to write only uh, such that you can't uh, extract the firmware, then it will be a little bit better. So uh, I'm really looking forward to making it more accessible for people oh. because right now it is a little bit of, uh, well, it's a bit problematic. So you need to Google a lot, you need to figure out how exactly to do it. So if you would have either a simple tool is to the simple manual that uh, that explains the security risks of this uh, do-it-yourself project, then it would be uh, it would be nice. I think that the most important is that people need to understand their their current security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So, so, so the best, the best, hopefully we can do it together. Yeah, the best the best use case is for is for like multi security, I suppose, and for multi sig and for um. Educational, educational, learning all about how hardware works, which, which is important. Educational definitely is important yeah. because then you learn uh, a lot about the security, also the hardware wallets that you actually use. Because right now there are too much marketing crap. Yeah. So like you always hear from every hardware wallet manufacturer that they're the best, they're the oldest, they're the most secure. And when you start researching, then you find that there were more than 10 hacks over half a year, and then uh, you're skeptical. Yeah, I mean, even even from my very limited knowledge, looking at some of these hardware audits, and they were talking about using like the, you know, the little OLED, the SSD 1306, whatever it is. Um, I was thinking that communicates over I2C or you know SPI, and there's like mm -hmm. a data in cave. There's a data in connection there. Like surely I could just hack that data in connection and start pulling out data or replacing you know uh, data um, uh, to to get it. So even even from my very limited knowledge and not being very black hat, like it's it's fairly easy to see some security flaws in some of these hardware wallets. So um, so yeah, I mean I think so. I think you're right. Sometimes maybe they're like. Um, a little bit too optimistic about their, their hardware wallets. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it's also because currently we don't have enough attackers that are actually trying to steal the funds from hardware wallets. So at the moment, hardware wallets that we have are OK as soon as the attackers are not too sophisticated. And I think that we have some time to uh, evolve and to get better hardware wallets before we will put our money at risk, actually. Here's a good one which, uh, which Christian Russell came up with. He said that, so if in a post-apocalyptic world, if I want to build my own hardware wallet, where can I find an ESP32? Like, because uh, I, mean, I, I, and it's a good point. Like maybe they're built into quadrocopters or some other consumer electronics which have some IoT functionality. Lamps, for example, the light bulbs, uh, smart, uh, smart light bulbs, uh, smart lamps from China, well, I'm for example. Too, yeah, so more recently my mom bought an uh, interesting, uh, this uh, kind of light, uh, well, not, not light bulb, but you know what you put on the ceiling, how it's called? The, yeah, like a, um, yeah, yeah, like a, yeah, no, like a light bulb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it had blue, Bluetooth connection, and it was not only just the light, but also like the sound. So you can connect from your uh, Android phone or like any phone over Bluetooth, and speaker. then you can actually use it as a speaker, yeah. Oh, cool. And so uh, when I opened it, I just saw ESP32 there. Uh, oh, that's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Brilliant. something like that. Very Actually, p thirty two is like everywhere right now. Probably in any smartish device uh, from China, you will find either ESP thirty two or ESP eight, uh, whatever the previous version. So that might be quite a fun hacky uh, tutorial: is to like build, go out into I don't know a hardware store and then build a build a hardware wallet using the stuff I can find in the hardware. Hopefully, find a ESP thirty two. And then fold up a little UART connection, so I can do USB connection to my computer and yeah, I know yeah it's that, would be fun. Hmm? that would be fun yeah, yeah. obviously we're using uh, for our project we're using a little e-paper display in the sp32 um, but you can get little the like esp32 pre-built into nice little uh, yeah, so, stuff so 
like uh, the M5 stack, for example, that already has the buttons and also has a tiny battery and the screen that you can use to actually make a full hardware wallet without you, you, soldering you, anything. That is a full hardware wallet you're holding right there, isn't it? Um, yeah, I uh, think that the battery is dead now, so I can't really power it on. But yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, also you can have even something smaller than that. Uh, it will be a little bit more tricky because the uh, screen is small and there is only one button. But uh, yeah, you can just buy them for and get get it actually nicely looking without any I mean, uh, assembling into the casing. I've ordered one of the, the stick one. I mean, that's like a 15, if you order it from AliExpress, it's like a $15 mm -hmm. device, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's basically an SP32 with a little low LED display and a button. Yes. Yeah, um, that's it. Uh, yeah, so I, I did hope also to try and like, you know, for some people who don't want to, it's like they're a bit put off and nervous about trying to plug wires in and things, mm -hmm. um, but just they could, they could handle or manage or cope with um, uh, flashing just some firmware. Uh, onto, onto the device. I did want to try and use something like the M5 stick. Um, uh, yeah, I think M5 stick and M5 stack are pretty good choices in this yeah. case. And also you have a chance to learn a bit more about embed development because they support both bare metal, Arduino and MicroPython. So yeah. like the perfect uh, tool to start playing with. Well, there we are. Well, thank you so much, Stefan. Um, it's been a pleasure. Sure. And I really wanted to get this interview to kind of wedge between the two tutorials, because obviously without you, uh, there would be no hardware wallet. Like, you've, it's, it's all you, it's all your stuff. Um, uh, so thank you so much. And thank you so much for, just for, you know, on behalf of all the tinkerers and all the makers out there, finally now we've got the ability to be able to start building our own hardware wallets, which is flipping awesome. And after the whole playlist, let's make another video. Maybe I will show you the uh, firmware that we are currently preparing for. Uh, devices like that and uh, for bitcoin core to do multi-signature so like to actually demo the hardware wallet that you did uh with bitcoin core and uh let's say treasure and cold card in the multi-signature setup wow yeah. that'd be flipping mad that would be nice um, yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah thank you so much and um uh thanks for everyone to watching and uh yeah uh, look out for that tutorial when i eventually make it in the next couple of weeks um and uh yeah uh, i hope to speak to you again like you say at the end of the series mm -hmm. uh, of tutorials um, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun. So yeah, thanks again. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for having me here.